Assassin's Creed has a lot, and I mean a lot of media. Everything you're seeing on screen is Assassin's Creed related, and there is so much of it. Whether it's the mainland games that we all know, books, comics, TV shows, mobile games, a movie, and much more. There's simply a lot of this series. So what I want to do in this video is explore the Assassin's Creed titles that you may not have heard of or perhaps you've just simply forgotten about. These will range from games that are considered canon, the multiplayer games, the mobile games and even some upcoming Assassin's Creed games that you might not even know about. Now a lot of these games actually have a main story to them but I'm not going to go in depth with the story of each game in this video as I'll be here all day. Instead, I'll most likely make a separate video going more in depth on some of these spin-offs. If you happen to enjoy this video, why not consider subscribing? Let's try and hit 50,000 subscribers by the end of April. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Before the storm of the Crusades that swept us over the very first Assassin's Creed game back in 2007, there was actually a prelude that a lot of people overlooked, and that was Assassin's Creed Altair's Chronicles. This was a game that was released back in 2008 for the Nintendo DS, which at that time was pretty groundbreaking. Ubisoft later improved the game with better graphics and gameplay for iOS devices and launched it a year later in 2009. After that, the game was also made available for Symbian Mobile, which was like some sort of operating system for mobile devices that I'm pretty sure does not exist anymore. Windows Phone 7 which fun fact was my first ever phone and also Sony Ericsson Xperia Play. Now the general plot of this game was focused on Altair one year before the actual events of Assassin's Creed 1. Oh and before anyone asks, yes this game is considered canon. The story begins with Altair who had just finished a different adventure in which the details are not mentioned. Altair finds out that the Templars and the Saracens are causing trouble. They're searching for the Chalice which is a legendary item said to grant its holder control over the lands. This is proven to be a problem when the Templars attack the town of Aleppo and go after Altair. What we must do is find the chalice with the goal of destroying it to prevent its power from falling into the wrong hands and that is pretty much the general plot of this DS Assassin's Creed game. I'm not going to give a full in-depth story review as there's a lot of games to get through in this video. Of course since it is a DS game, don't expect Altair's Chronicles to be some sort of open world adventure where Altair can freely parkour from rooftop to rooftop chasing down Templars. Instead, it's more like a platform game filled with a lot of jumping, dodging and even some sword fighting. There are also some mini games where Altair needs to steal items or question people to gather information. However, these minigames don't really hit the mark as they seem to be just thrown in without much thought. For example, stealing a key just meant moving an item to an exit spot or tapping on numbers to interrogate someone. What's more, sometimes after you steal from someone, you can just kill them, which makes you wonder why you needed to steal in the first place. The game also introduces gadgets and abilities not seen in the original Assassin's Creed game, which was a bit of a surprise considering that we got this game after Assassin's Creed 1. While Altair's Chronicles may not have the depth or scale of the mainline games, it does definitely stand out for its effort to adapt the Assassin's Creed formula to handheld devices. You know, looking back at it now in 2024, for a DS game, the graphics are actually pretty impressive. There's a few detailed environments with effective lighting and shadow techniques. You can see the sun reflecting off golden domes and light streaming through trees, creating shadows on the streets below. The cities are rendered quite well, with intricate details on market stores and building exteriors. It's unfortunate though that you're not able to explore these cities more extensively, but hey, beggars can't be choosers. After all, this is a pretty old game not made for consoles. Now what's pretty unfortunate is that in 2013, the game was taken down from both the App Store and Play Store, so it's no longer available for iOS and Android devices, and so the game just faded into oblivion. Now that brings me on to the next game, which relates a lot to Altair's Chronicles. Assassin's Creed Bloodlines, a game in a similar boat to Altair's Chronicles. This game is an often overlooked entry in the series. Bloodlines was released exclusively for the PlayStation Portable, aka the PSP in 2009. This game continues right where Assassin's Creed 1 left off, following Altair as he heads to Cyprus on a mission to find and eliminate the remaining Templars. Now if you're slightly confused as to the structure of these three Altair games, just know that Altair's Chronicles is set in 1190, Assassin's Creed 1 is set in 1191, and Assassin's Assassin's Creed Bloodlines is set immediately after the events of Assassin's Creed 1. This might be the only quote unquote trilogy that's set within one year of each other. Bloodlines was a game that kind of provided a deeper insight to the journey of Altair and his connections to future characters in the series. 
Oh yeah, and it was also canon, just like RTS Chronicles. This game is similar to Assassin's Creed 1 actually. You can explore big open worlds, talk to NPCs, visit safe houses, complete quests, and do missions to move the story forward. The game is shown from a 3D third person perspective, just like the console versions. Right from the start, you'll be climbing buildings, running across rooftops, and moving through areas to collect items and discover new places. At first, there's really not much exploring you can do, but after the first big boss fight, the game really opens up. This means you can roam more freely and choose what you want to do, including following the main story or just exploring. The gameplay in Bloodlines closely mirrors that of the first Assassin's Creed, emphasizing stealth, parkour and combat. However, since it is of course on a handheld console, the game introduces several modifications to adapt to the PSP's controls and screen size. We're able to navigate Altair through the cities of Limassol and Kyrenia, engaging in sword fights, assassinations and the gathering of information, much like the original game, but within the confines of a more linear and focused storyline. Now, I will admit one thing, the storylines of Bloodlines is, well, how can you say, it's just straight up terrible. The plot is pretty much Altair searching for an Apple of Eden, and just chasing the last of the Templars from Acre to the Islands of Limassol. However, this time Altair is not alone, he's got a Templar named Maria with him as a prisoner. I'm sure you can already guess which Maria this is. So pretty much as both Altair and Maria follow the Templars, hiding from enemies and meeting friends from the Brotherhood, Altair wants to find out why the Templars bought the island where Limassol is, and learn more about the mysterious artifacts he's found. The story is not anything amazing, it's really just straightforward, and it focuses solely on chasing Templars, without giving us any depth or emotion at all, so I do recommend playing the first game before this to get the full experience. Now one thing that's quite interesting about this game is how it has a connection to Assassin's Creed 2, and no, not a narrative connection, but, you guessed it, additional content connection. You're able to link the game with Assassin's Creed 2 on the PlayStation 3, and unlock some additional content in both games such as weapons and collectibles. If you collected enough codex pages in Assassin's Creed 2, you could unlock extra health bonuses in Bloodlines. You could also get upgrades for the Hidden Blade in Bloodlines, that are similar to the upgrades available in the actual Assassin's Creed 2 game. So I guess that's cool how there's a slight interconnection between those two games. So yeah, despite Bloodlines being a relatively important game to the lore of the franchise, it is definitely overshadowed by the mainline games due to its exclusive release on the PSP and the limitations of handheld gaming at that time. Nonetheless though, it still shows us an important chapter of Altair's story that is considered canon. Next up, we have a game that I quite enjoyed playing a while back, and that is Assassin's Creed 2 Discovery. Now, although that name does sound like a Discovery tour mode of the game, it's far from that. Assassin's Creed 2 Discovery is a game that's often overlooked compared to the franchise's larger titles. And the main reason is because, well, it's a side-scroller game. Released for the Nintendo DS in 2009 and later for iOS, this game offers a very different blend of action and adventure that's set against the backdrop of the Renaissance. Discovery was a game created by Gryptonite Games, a company that would later become part of Glue Mobile. The plot of this game I believe happens at the same time as the events in Assassin's Creed 2. In fact, it's set between sequence 12 and 13, which if you remember from Assassin's Creed 2 is when the two DLCs Battle of Foley and Bonfire of Vanity takes place. Very questionable DLCs I must say. Now here's a fun fact, Steve Jobs, who was the CEO of Apple at that time, announced the game's development during a keynote speech on September 9th, 2009. So about the game, this game as I mentioned is set within the timeline of Assassin's Creed 2 and it follows the story of Ezio as he travels beyond the familiar Italian cities to Spain. The story dives into Ezio's mission to rescue fellow assassins who have fallen victim to the Spanish Inquisition, which was a dark period when the Catholic Church served to purge heresy. The gameplay of this game is mostly linear, which practically consists of moving from one level to the other. The idea was that we'd guide Ezio through various levels, utilizing his acrobatic skills to parkour over obstacles, evade enemies or engage in combat. The game emphasizes speed and fluidity, and it really does encourage you to do things swiftly and silently as possible. These various levels I mentioned are sorted into three types. There are normal levels, where you can do things your own way and explore the area to find collectibles. There's chase levels, where you need to rush to your goal while avoiding fights with enemies. And the last levels are stealth levels, which are missions that require you to steer clear of fighting enemies directly. Instead, you can quietly take out enemies if needed. You're generally allowed to be spied up to three times. If you were seen more than that, then you'd fail the mission. Those are the three level types in this game, and they were quite fun to do back then. So yeah, this game was a pretty interesting and generic game, but it was a game that I for some reason enjoyed back then. So in a Reddit Q&A session, Ama Azizia, who's the head of content for Assassin's Creed, initially said that Assassin's Creed 2 Discovery was not canon because of what happens in the Assassin's Creed movie, but he later changed his stance and confirmed that the game is indeed canon. So that's pretty fascinating to know. 
Now this game brings back some pretty deep memories. Who else remembers Assassin's Creed 2 multiplayer? Now don't get this confused with the actual multiplayer mode in Brotherhood, because this one is definitely a lot different. Assassin's Creed 2 multiplayer was designed exclusively for mobile devices, and it was a game that introduced a completely different genre, with a competitive online environment where strategy, stealth and quick reflexes were the most important parts of how to play. So essentially how this game worked was that you'd be thrown into a deathmatch with up to 4 players. It's viewed from a top down perspective, and offers 3 maps inspired by Assassin's Creed 2. Once in the game, you'd get matched with others online, and receive targets to assassinate which are actual real life players. The idea was to search for these targets and take them out, however if you eliminate the wrong person you'll blow your cover, but getting it right earns you points. Now one thing I did like about this game was that it had a kind of leaderboard system to rank your progress, as well as a system to connect with friends, but of course back then I uh, played on my own. Now as I mentioned earlier, the maps in this game were inspired by the ones in Assassin's Creed 2. There's the Venice Carnival, which I'm sure a lot of us remember that sequence, the slums of Venice, and also the Rome Cathedral. Each map is special in its own way. Take the Venice Carnival map. This is a map that has little tents around the edges, where you can hide and ambush others. But this map is mostly about showing off your skills, because it doesn't really change the game as much as the others. The slums of Venice map features a tower in the middle, that lets you see the whole area, similar to a sink point. The Rome Cathedral map has a big church in the middle, if you go inside, others cannot see you from outside. So yeah, the maps in this game were definitely unique and had their own advantages and disadvantages to them. Now as for the actual game, if it's still available, well I don't really have an iPhone or an iPod, so I can't really check. So that's my request from you guys. If you have an iPhone, search Assassin's Creed 2 multiplayer in the App Store and comment below if it still exists. I doubt it, especially considering it's a ridiculously old game, especially for a mobile game. But yeah, I had to include this game in this video as it was a fun game to play back then when I was a kid. Assassin's Creed Multiplayer Rearmed was a game designed exclusively for mobile platforms. Now this game was actually built upon the foundation of the last game that I talked about in this video, which was Assassin's Creed 2 Multiplayer. This game was developed by Ubisoft for the iPad, iPhone and iPod Touch and was launched on October 21st 2011. It's a game that offers a top down 2D multiplayer experience where up to 4 players compete in a 5 minute match. The game is essentially about hunting and assassinating targets while avoiding being caught. Your target is shown on the top left of your screen, and a compass arrow helps guide you to them, disappearing as you get closer. You can see scores at the top right, a 5 minute countdown timer at the top, and your available skills at the bottom right. This game isn't exactly anything innovative as the multiplayer game I talked about previously was the inspiration for this. However, the good thing about this game was its variety in maps. You were able to have the opportunity to take part against one another across several maps, such as Venice, Alhambra, Jerusalem, San Donato and Antioch, but other than that, it's your standard Assassin's Creed top down multiplayer game for mobile devices. So let's just move on. Ok here's where it gets interesting, these next 5 games in the video are all similar to each other, but each game offers something different and is not a multiplayer game like I previously mentioned. Now before I talk about these 5 games, I just want you to know that none of these games are canon, so when I start talking about the story of these games, do remember that as there are a lot, and I mean a lot of key differences between the mobile story and the original story. So this first game is called Assassin's Creed, and yes that's the name of the game. Now before you say it, no this is not the Assassin's Creed game you're thinking of, but instead a mobile version of that game. This mobile Assassin's Creed 1 game was created by Gameloft, which is related to Ubisoft. That name brings back memories. I remember Gameloft being such a big and iconic publisher. This is off topic but who remembers Shrek Forever After on Xbox 360 years ago? That was when Gameloft was good. Anyway going back to Assassin's Creed 1, this actually came out in 2007 at the exact same time as the mainland game. Pretty much the game's plot is similar to the main one, focusing on Altair during the third crusade, where he's on a mission to restore his honour and position by targeting different Templars. You know, the usual that we saw in Assassin's Creed 1. But the mobile version showcases it in a different gameplay perspective. This game consists of 13 levels set across Acre, Masyaf and Jerusalem. We're able to sprint, dash, crouch, roll jump, you name it. It's a more dumb down version of the mainline game but for mobile. The game is full of complex paths and interactive elements like mechanisms and torches, making navigation and strategy important. It's similar to another game I talked about at the start of this video, being Assassin's Creed Altair's Chronicles, in how the environment plays a big role. Now since this game is intended to be a mobile version of the main game, there will be some differences. In fact there's a lot of differences, but I'm not going to read all of them out as there are way too many, but I'll give you a few. For example, uses of bombs, grappling hooks and crossbows are unique to the mobile game. 
Another difference is that the game introduces new elements, like blending in with crowds, not just scholars, and facing a special enemy with twin sabers. The storyline differs too, especially with how the Apple of Eden is handled, and also the betrayal of Masiaf. In short, the mobile game offers a condensed and slightly altered version of Assassin's Creed 1 story, with unique gameplay choices only suitable for mobile devices. The next game is Assassin's Creed 2. Now, as I mentioned previously, the mobile game named Assassin's Creed 1 was a game that followed the original Assassin's Creed, but for mobile devices. This follows that same approach. Assassin's Creed 2 is a platform video game published and developed by none other than Gameloft themselves. It was released back in 2009 at the same time when Assassin's Creed 2 was released. The plot of this mobile game closely mirrors the main version, but it also has some differences. The game has 9 levels, taking us through Florence, Venice and Forley, and even includes some missions like using the flying machine for escape missions, which I felt was kind of a bit surprising, especially for an old mobile game. Ezio has a wide range of abilities and weapons in the game, such as running, jumping and using items like his hidden blade and sword, you know, the usual shtick. However, the mobile game sets all the events in 1486, unlike the main game which spans from 1476 to 1499. There's also other differences such as Ezio using weapons like a boomerang and a grappling hook, which are not found in the main game. One cool feature is that Ezio can hang enemies from trees with his grappling hook and even move haystack cards from inside to stay hidden, which I'm 99% sure is not in included in the main game. The story and characters have some changes too. For example, Leonardo da Vinci plays a much more focused role, giving Ezio missions, and also Ezio's relationships with other characters like Lorenzo de Michi are slightly different. In the ending, where Ezio defeats Rodrigo, the story wraps up a bit differently from the main game. Ezio thinks he's finished being an assassin and wants to live peacefully, but right after he beats Rodrigo, the Apple of Eden shows a hologram of Minerva, which in the mobile game, she's not exactly named, but it is evidently her. Through this hologram, she sends a warning to Desmond Mars about a future threat to humanity. This important moment happens happens right after Ezio takes the apple, not in the Vatican vault like in the main game, but right after the Battle of Forley. The same goes with the Assassin's Creed Brotherhood mobile game. This game, just like the last one, was also developed and published by Gameloft and was released back in 2010. The story is also the same as the mainline game, but there were a few differences in this game that I were talking about. The first one is that in the mainline game, we're able to find Caterina and Lucrezia in Rome's Castel San Angelo, but in the mobile game, they're found in Florence. Another story difference is that instead of capturing Lucrezia, which is what we do in the original, we actually kill her instead to rescue Katharina. The main difference is honestly the time period of the game. In the mobile game, all the events occur in 1486, which is different from the main game that covers from 1500 to 1507. Oh, and also for some strange reason, this mobile version of Brotherhood completely skips over the fact that Templars exist and are just straight up not mentioned in the game at all. So yeah, overall, Ezio's journey in this Brotherhood mobile game is just driven by revenge for Mario Auditore's death and to get back the Apple of Eden. He's more ruthless in this version, showing no mercy to his enemies. The final game in Ezio's journey is, of course, Assassin's Creed Revelations, and it's only right for Gameloft to create a mobile version of this game too. Just like the last three games, this game was released alongside its main counterpart for mobile devices. The gameplay of this game mirrors that of the other mobile versions, featuring a 2D side-scrolling setup where you move through levels, taking out guards and objectives with straightforward controls. There are, I believe, 9 levels in this game, including 2 that incorporates Leonardo da Vinci's flying machine. The game takes us to diverse settings like Constantinople, Masiaf, and Derinkiu, which is an underground city that serves as a fortress to the Templars. It's pretty much Cappadocia, but this game decided to use its other name. Now, the differences from the mobile game and the main game also come into play here. For example, characters like Sophia, Suleiman, and Yusuf, as well as Abba Sofian, are not mentioned at all in this game, which is a bit strange. And also, the final showdown with Prince Ahmed it happens in Masyaf instead of, you know, that random cliff in the game. Oh, and get this, when we take down Prince Ahmed in the mobile game instead of his brother, his body just dissolves because of the Apple of Eden. This game strongly portrayed Prince Ahmed as some sort of big strong guy in armour, instead of a regular man in a robe as we see in the original. There are also some other small minor differences, but those are the ones I felt that we're talking about. And that brings me to the final mobile counterpart of an original Assassin's Creed game, and that is Assassin's Creed 3. Just like the last 4 games in this video, this was also developed and published by Gameloft and was released alongside the original in 2012. Now I'll be honest, I didn't really play this one at all. What I do know is that this game consists of 9 levels, 2 of which surprisingly make use of the Aquila and contain locations such as Boston, New York and the Frontier. This game has several key differences from the main Assassin's Creed 3 game. For one, Kana is never referred to as Radan Hagedun in the entire game, not even by his own tribe. Instead, his tribe simply referred to him as the Mohawk. 
Another difference is that you're not able to play as Haytham Kenway at all. Characters like Achilles Davenport, Haytham's lover who I won't bother pronouncing, and also that Native American childhood friend of Kana who I also won't pronounce are not mentioned in this game at all. In terms of story differences, one massive one is that in the very first level there's a scene that includes Charles Lee shooting Kana who then falls off a cliff into a lake. Another difference is how Haytham is portrayed as just a bad guy, working against the patriarch cause, with no family connection to Connor at all. And lastly, the final showdown with Charles Lee is a lot different. It includes a carriage chase and a British ambush, and it happens in Boston instead of Monmouth. So yeah, that's why at the start of this segment, I did say that these games are definitely not considered canon at all. So don't look into the narrative and lore side of it too much. Assassin's Creed Pirates Everybody really liked the naval battles in Assassin's Creed 3 and Black Flag, right? Well, there's a game that's focused entirely on these battles. Now, before anyone gets too excited, it's important to note that Assassin's Creed Pirates is not a traditional Assassin's Creed game. It does not have the assassin-focused gameplay that's a big part of the usual stuff we know. In this game, you only get to control a ship itself. There's no running around, boarding other ships or watching cutscenes. This choice was made for two reasons. For one, it would be too hard to make the controls for those actions work well on a phone. And for two, mobile devices cannot exactly show character faces well enough. Assassin's Creed Pirates is a game, of course, made for mobile devices, and it was developed by Ubisoft Paris and released back in 2013. The game pretty much starts off with a scene from Abstergo that introduces us to Alonso Badia, a young captain who crosses path with the notorious pirate Labuse. This encounter forces us to use the Animus and play as Batia, aiming to discover the secrets and story of Labuse. You see, while the story of Assassin's Creed Pirates might not be as engaging or fun as in the other Assassin's Creed titles, it was a pretty decent game for this size. Now, although the game is definitely unique, the actual gameplay felt very repetitive. The main objective involved starting in a region, attacking ships, completing missions, collecting resources and then using those resources to buy or upgrade new ships before moving on to the next area. Each area is filled with numerous side quests, a story mission and plenty of ships to attack or avoid. When it comes to the side quests, they were a bit hit and miss to be honest. A few were decent, like the ones focused on exploration which captures the essence of a traditional Assassin's Creed game. However, quests that lean more towards typical mobile game mechanics can feel out of place and overly simple. Now, Assassin's Creed Pirates was a game that surprisingly had its own community and it came out with regular updates for quite a while, such as adding new locations, mission types, ships and even new challenges. Combat in the game was quite straightforward, alternating between turn-based attacks and defenses. You were able to use different icons for actions, like firing cannons and using swivel shots for targeted, powerful attacks, all of which had cooldown periods. Actually defending your ship was quite simple too. You see, I feel like the combat would not be so repetitive if it was not part of almost every activity except for checkpoint races. The exciting assassination missions start with moving to dangerous waters to reach a target ship. Once you make contact, you have to defeat this ship within a set time limit. Each mission includes around 3 extra objectives, such as not taking damage, completing it within a certain time, or maybe a limitation, like not using specific weapons or cell boosters. Now I would have recommended you guys to play this game, but following the release of iOS 11 back in 2017, the game was just removed from the app store without any announcement at all. So it's a game that just lives on in memories. Now this could be considered a controversial addition to this video, as there will be quite a fair amount of people that already know of or have even played the Assassin's Creed Chronicles games, but it's still worth talking about in this video because for one, it's not a mainline series, and for two, it's massively overlooked. Now if you don't know what I'm referring to, I'm talking about the three games Assassin's Creed Chronicles China, India and Russia. Each one of these three games are different to a mainline Assassin's Creed game. It's different stylistically in that it's set on a 2.5D plane, just like the game I talked about earlier in the video with Discovery. The Chronicles trilogy features three assassins from different eras, Xiao Zhen in China during 1526, Arbaz Mir in India in 1841, and Nikolai Arilov in Russia in 1918. Their main mission is to uncover and stop Templar schemes. The game tells their stories through animated kind of comic style scenes with voice acting that honestly is a bit all over the place. I often have to turn the volume up because the characters voices would sometimes be too low. However, even without paying close attention to the dialogue, you're not missing out on much, as the stories are not really focused on being very deep. The stealth mechanics are a feature in these three games that I gotta hand to Ubisoft, as it's implemented in a way that suits its 2.5D style gameplay, but the combat system and the level design fall quite short. Unlike in the mainline Assassin's Creed games, where you can defend yourself if a mission goes wrong, this game almost penalizes you for any mistake, with enemies capable of defeating you in just a few hits. The combat controls are also awkward and 
and unresponsive, often requiring multiple button presses to perform simple actions, only to end up being defeated by an enemy. The level design of each mission is really not that appealing either. The environment tends to look too similar, making it hard to figure out where to go next. Of course, since it is a 2.5D game, it does limit your ability to view the entire map for moving around. I'm pretty sure one mission took me quite a while to complete, simply because I just didn't know where to go next, and that often can be the case with these three games. The way I managed to know where to go is a bit stupid because I was randomly jumping and I managed to discover the path by doing this. You see, if this game had somehow captured more of what makes a traditional Assassin's Creed game enjoyable, I would have honestly liked these games a lot more. Now that's not to say these three games are terrible, in fact I really did like Assassin's Creed Chronicles China. As for the other two, well let's just say I'm not the biggest fan of those. Now Chronicles China is a game I enjoyed because of a few reasons. The story was decent, the protagonist is quite cool, and the overall atmosphere felt more appealing to me than Russia and India. This game follows the story of the assassin Xiao Jun, who after meeting Ezio in an animated short film called Embers, which I do recommend you guys watch as it tells the final story of Ezio, returns to China to seek revenge against the Templars. Although the game is not very long, it still offers enough content to be enjoyable. I actually liked the game enough to want to play it again in the new game plus mode, which is more challenging but it makes it all the more appealing to play. This game also introduced us to the hidden footblade, which if you've been watching me for a while, then you'd know I love the footblade. In fact when I made my video ranking every type of hidden blade, I'm pretty sure I placed the footblade played as my number one. Now one aspect of the game that I really liked is the artwork, it's simply stunning. The art is used in cutscenes, with character narrations and conversations laid over it. Now although Russia and India also have pretty nicely designed artwork, for me it's Chronicles China that stands out a lot more. So yeah, the trilogy of Assassin's Creed Chronicles is a trilogy that I recommend. If you're into the lore side and more deeper understanding of the series then it's a great set of games to play. Now if you've been paying close attention to this video, you'd know the mobile side of Assassin's Creed is quite heavy. Ubisoft really did love their mobile games, especially the ones related to Assassin's Creed, and this game is no exception. Well except for the fact that it's a lot better than many mobile Assassin's Creed games released in the past, and this one is called Assassin's Creed Identity. This game is a third person action game for Android, developed by Ubisoft Blue Byte. Unlike Assassin's Creed Pirates, which I talked about earlier in this video, this game mirrors the gameplay of the main games, but adapted it for touch controls. It's set during the Italian Renaissance and even received some DLC in May 2016, adding a new area to explore. The world map of the game features locations that will be quite familiar to anyone who has played the mainline games. As you explore this world, you collect items that reveal more about the overarching story. However, I did notice that a notable downside is the game's lack of an engaging storyline. I found that each mission really lacks a compelling narrative to actually drive my interest. Now despite this, the game remains faithful to the classic Assassin's Creed gameplay that a lot of fans appreciate. You can still sneak up on enemies, perform assassinations and climb buildings. Essentially it offers the closest experience to Assassin's Creed currently available, so there's not much to criticise. When I played it on my phone back when it was released, which wasn't exactly the best of phones, the graphics were pretty decent for an Android game. The controls however felt a bit clumsy, with the limited number of buttons on the screen compared to a console controller, actions like parkour were simply just automated. I just had to move, rotate the camera and perform actions like attacking or delivering a letter. There were times I thought I could perform a certain move, but the game would not allow it, making jumping between buildings feel restricted. Now in terms of character selection, the game introduces several new heroes, offering you a choice among three distinct classes, the Berserker, the Shadow Blade and the Trickster. The game gives you the opportunity to personalise your characters with different outfits and colours. Now there are a few issues I had with this game besides the ones I already mentioned. For one, many gameplay elements have been simplified or just removed, yet it still manages to capture that feeling of an Assassin's Creed game. Upgrades in the game are often subtle and not easily noticed. The game tends to be easy and the missions lack any type of innovation. If I'm not mistaken, after completing around 9 to 10 missions, you'll notice that the same missions are repeated with only minor variations. So yeah, that's pretty much Assassin's Creed Identity. If you want to play the game, well that's a shame because you can't. The game was removed from all online stores in December 2021 and the servers are just simply no more. Now this game is a spicy game, not in terms of how good it is, but how terrible it is. Assassin's Creed Rebellion is a game that has a reputation of just not being a good game at all. In fact, it's the perfect definition of what a Ubisoft mobile game is. Now because I honestly hate this game, I don't really want to talk about it. So what I'm going to do is let my fellow Assassin's Creed YouTuber talk about it. And that person is The Exile, a person I highly recommend checking out if you like Assassin's Creed. He's pretty underrated and deserves all the attention. I'll leave a link to his channel in the description. Yeah, cheers hidden one mate. That's uh, re really kind of you. So the most appealing thing about Assassin's Creed Rebellion is, unlike most games on this list, it's still available to play and is actively being updated. Or at least I think so. 
The last update for the game was 10 months ago as of recording, and included bug fixes. After playing this game, I have come away with the feeling that I've wasted two hours of my life. But then again, you must remember that AC Rebellion is a free-to-play mobile game. And what are most mobile games made for these days? To waste time away and your hard-earned cash. But more on that later. Rebellion is a cool idea for a mobile game and can at times be maybe not fun, but satisfying. It's not a game that reinvents the wheel, especially since the game's core mechanics are taken directly from Bethesda's Fallout Shelter, another smartphone game. But if you've got a minute or 10 to chill out, maybe on your lunch break or on the bus, it pretty much does the job of alleviating your boredom. Rebellion's gameplay loop is to send out your heroes on quests in order to level them up but more importantly, to gather resources so you can upgrade your Brotherhood HQ. Heroes consist of randomly named characters and some of the main protagonists of the AC franchise, such as Altair, Ezio, or Eivor. Each can be leveled up through quests. They can also be equipped with gear you craft for them as you play. That's the gameplay loop. You quest, you level up, you craft. You quest, you level up, you craft. And on, and on, and on. Yeah, it's pretty much the model that's been standardized in mobile gaming. Why is such a simple gameplay loop so common, I hear you ask? Because that's what makes money. And I'd be doing my boy the hidden one a disservice if I didn't mention the classic Ubisoft monetization tactics deeply rooted in Rebellion. It's Ubisoft's usual run-of-the-mill microtransaction behavior, this time geared specifically towards buying more gold, time savers, and loot boxes, among other things. Now, although I'm firmly against microtransactions in full-price video games, I am personally more lenient with free-to-play games, especially ones for mobile. If a game is indeed free and doesn't bombard you with ads at the end of every level, then yeah. I think it's fair to include microtransactions, so that's not really my issue with Rebellion. My real issue is that the game doesn't excite or appeal to me in any way. At first I found it quite satisfying to assassinate enemies with my hero's hidden blade, and it was interesting to see what other abilities you could mess around with, but then I'd complete the level, head back to my HQ, realise I didn't have enough gold or resources to upgrade much, and I'd have to keep grinding. Grinding to me in any game, mobile, AAA, or anything in between, really grinds no, my gears. No, a little fuck, uh, a play on words there. Yeah, 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 I know. I have more of a silver tongue than that of the fox himself. Uh, uh, anyway, when it comes to a storyline for Assassin's Creed Rebellion, it kind of exists, but it can't be considered as canon because it literally makes no sense. For starters, characters like Aguilar, a young Ezio, and Yusuf Tazim interact with one another in Spain. Secondly, you have to collect multiple codex pages throughout the world, even though Ezio had already collected them all, and we know for a fact how many Altair wrote. Not to mention how a specific interaction with him and Niccolo Polo resulted in them ending up in Italy in the first place. Yeah, shut your eyes, don't look into it too much, said Yves Gimo at the Ubisoft offices one day. Probably. Overall, if you like Assassin's Creed and you've got a minute or two in between more important things, then give this game a go. Maybe you've just had Mexican food and really need the bathroom. You're probably going to be in there a while. Grab your phone and play some AC Rebellion. I can't guarantee it'll ease the pain. In fact, it might make it worse, but it's something to do. There you go, hidden one. Thanks for that. Now you owe me 10 Ubisoft loot boxes. Assassin's Creed Freerunners is a free-to-play browser-based game developed by Ubisoft Da Nang as part of Ubisoft Nano, which focuses on creating party games for browsers using Ubisoft's games franchises. It draws the visual style and assets from the game mentioned previously being Assassin's Creed Rebellion, and it offers a range of playable assassins. Now funnily enough, this is a game I actually played with some of the members in my Discord server, and although it was a pretty short experience, it was quite fun. Oh and by the way, Discord link in the description. Now essentially this game is a competitive side-scrolling game where your character automatically runs through a course alongside other assassins, which of course will be other online people. Your goal is to reach the end of the course before them, using them as a way to gauge your progress. 
pretty much the only control you have is to make your character jump. This can be done by tapping the screen on mobile devices or pressing the space bar on a PC or laptop. This game lets you execute double jumps, wall jumps and swing off grappling points. Now timing these actions perfectly can give your character a speed boost, helping you get ahead of the competition. As you run, you can collect coins marked with the assassin's insignia, with more valuable paths usually higher up in the course. And that's pretty much the gameplay of this game. Your objective is simply to finish first. It's a very short race, but it is an exciting race. If you have like 2 or 3 or maybe even 4 friends, then I do recommend playing this friendly game. Now that brings me to a game that will be released quite soon as of me making this video and that is Assassin's Creed Jade. Now I'm looking forward to this game. It's a completely different wave of mobile game for Assassin's Creed as it surprisingly consists of a pretty large open world. So Assassin's Creed Jade, if you have not figured it out by now, is an upcoming mobile game that's set to release sometime in 2024. I'm pretty sure this game got delayed if I'm not mistaken. Now the general plot of Assassin's Creed Jade is experiencing the story of the 3rd century BC during the early days of China's first unified empire. Our protagonist is the adopted child of the master Wei Yu. Now if that name sounds familiar to you, well Wei Yu is actually the statue under Villa Auditore in Monteregioni. So that's a fun fact for you right there. The story of our protagonist is one that goes on a path of vengeance after a close friend is betrayed, which once again is a pretty common Ubisoft story. Now the setting of this game is one that I'm looking forward to, but ancient China because in this game we'll be experiencing the likes of the Great Wall of China, which of course is one of the seven wonders of the world, or at least it was the last time I checked. We'll also explore the imperial city of Xianyang. Oh yeah, and Cassandra is somehow involved. I don't know how, but she just is. So yeah, that's pretty much Assassin's Creed Jade. I do have a pretty powerful phone, so maybe Maybe I might make some videos on the game once it releases, I don't know yet. Now the last game in this video is a game that honestly has not much information about it. It's pretty much an upcoming Assassin's Creed Netflix mobile game, whatever that means. It's supposed to be developed by Ubisoft but published onto the Netflix app, which does make sense considering Netflix recently have launched their games platform. Has anybody actually tried that? Let me know in the comments below if you have. Now this game was announced sometime in 2022 during the Assassin's Creed showcase at the Ubisoft Forward event. You see, apparently it's unique because it'll be ad free and it won't have any in-app purchases according to the announcement. However, Details about the game's setting, the themes or characters have not yet been shared. It's also unclear if this game will tie in with the live action Assassin's Creed series currently in the works, so I guess we'll just have to wait and see. So there you have it. This was Assassin's Creed games you probably forgot about or just simply might not know about. Now there are of course a few games I've not mentioned in this video, but those are games that I can guarantee you nobody cares about. I mean one of them is a goddamn board game and I'm not wasting my time talking about board games. Let me know in the comments if any of these games piqued your interest or perhaps how many of these games you've heard about. If you did enjoy this video, be sure to hit that subscribe button and with that said, I'll see you in the next one.